Welcome everyone. Welcome to this uh, Market Thursday. Uh, we are March the 18th. It's five o'clock in, in London. Um, this is the webinar that I try to do every two weeks now. Um, I'll try to do maybe some during the weekends if you have uh, specific topics. So that's something I could do. Um, so as a quick disclaimer, as always, uh, those webinars are not investment advice. Uh, this is really for information. Uh, so please do your own research before doing anything. I try to help you uh, with the process, um, but um, I'm not necessarily making the market calls uh, or making buy on and sells. And as well, uh, I might have some position here and there. Uh, so I'm not trying to pump any of my position. This is not what I do. Uh, so quickly, presentation. Um, so I started to work in uh, 2000 in Paris as a cash equity trader, uh, working for an asset manager. Uh, then in 2004, I joined uh, a hedge fund here in London called uh, um, uh, Griffin Capital Management, where I worked for four years uh, on the long only product and on the long short product. As a band from 2009 to 2018, I worked as a prop trader for Infinity Capital Market. I recently rejoined them a couple of months ago, um, having a long short book. And since 2014, I've been mentoring people from all over the world, uh, working for another company from 2014 to 2017. We split ways. And in 2018, I started my own mentoring program. And in uh, 2019, I launched a four by four video series, uh, which uh, some of you have been doing, uh, which is a, a giving you an investment uh, process. So what about today? What are we going to be covering? So as always, we're going to be looking at the situation across asset classes, uh, the four of them, uh, stocks, credit, commodities, and FX, looking at the recent performances. Um, that will be um, maybe longer than usual because this is something that um, has been important uh, based on the dispersion in the market. So some sectors, some assets have been doing much better than others. Uh, then we'll be looking at the macro analysis and what the Fed has been saying yesterday. Um, then looking again at the rotation, more uh, into um, uh, trading with uh, the expiry that is tomorrow with the quality pool reaching day and the index rebalancing. Um, so let's, let's start first with the asset class performances, uh, looking at how the different uh, assets have been doing recently. Uh, so here, this is the, 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 the week to date, what about I have the, uh, sorry, our, the two, our week to date. So um, those two charts are going to be the same, but um, uh, we had uh, year, uh, year to date a strong market across um, asset classes, risky asset classes. So the S&P is up uh, 5%. Um, Week to date, we are up. We had some kind of a hiccups uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were doing the other uh, webinars uh, based on the US 10 years. That's something that we're going to be looking. So yields are going up. So that has a um, reaction of the market has been some selling off uh, for the equity market uh, from some growth um, uh, and, and growth versus value. Um, other, other than that, um, if we look at the, uh, at the FX world, um, it is pretty uh, flattish and, and trending in the in a one to three percent range. Uh, the dollar is, is trending uh, around 120 versus the euro. Um, if we look at the gold and the WTI, so uh, year year to date, WTI is up uh, uh, 30 percent. So that is really the, the big winner. So sorry, um, that is uh, the chart that we should have um, for the week. What about the uh, year-to-date asset class performances? Um, so um, as we've seen a couple of weeks ago, um, XLE, which is the energy, has been uh, extremely strong, up uh, 37%, uh, followed by the financial. So that was as of yesterday. Uh, today, there is um, another move up on the financial. So KBE, KRE, which are the banks, are up 4% on the steepening of the yield curve on uh, as well uh, the Fed being very, um, let's say, um, keen for, for banks to be lending, meaning that uh, we have a lot of liquidity going into the system, which is benefiting the banks, why the steepening and as well the US economy, uh, which is expected to do well with the fiscal stimulus. Um, 
on the week to date, energy is, is coming from its highs. Uh, it's now trading at six, uh, 50, 60 roughly, uh, coming from the DIs at, at, at 54. So that has been a big winner. Um, and as we can see, uh, it's uh, um, correlation with the, the WTI. So the most important part for this year so far has been this one. It's very similar to what we had a couple of weeks ago, which is the bonds are selling off, yields are going up. Um, so the US 10 years, the US Treasury is up 73 bips year to date and is trading around 175 now. So we started the, the year at around 1% on the US 10 years. Now we are at 175. On the week on week, we have a 15 bips move and uh, interestingly, this move is not only in the US, it's uh, in the UK, a bit less in Europe. But if you think that in Europe, the ECB want as much as, com as possible to uh, uh, contain uh, those yields, um, that is quite a big move. So there has been a lot of, of, of selling pressure on the bond market. Um, if we look at the top winners, top losers, as always, those are the, the, the funny names that are moving big. In terms of the VIX, this is um, something that is that is important and we're going to be looking at when we'll be looking at the price action. The VIX is now trading below the, the 20 level. Um, so you know historically that the VIX is, is on average trading around 19%. Uh, and if you look at what happened in 2008, 2009, it took a bit of time for the VIX uh, to go much lower than the 20. Why? Because people were... Uh, and market participants were hedging uh, their portfolio for quite a long time. So when you have a big shock, uh, you have a tendency of, a human tendency of, of hedging your book for longer than, or, or to overpaying to, for what it should be. Um, so now the VIX is, 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 is now trending finally below, uh, below the 20% uh, level. Having said that, as we're gonna see, very often when we come into the expiry, um, the VIX is slowly but surely coming down. So yesterday we have the we had the expiry of the VIX futures. Tomorrow we're gonna have the quadruple reaching, meaning that all the, the futures, the options, any derivatives are expiring tomorrow. And as I said, very often the VIX comes down and the underlying, which is the S&P and, and, and the risky assets are going up. Um, so what about now we're gonna go into the uh, price action. Um, so let's start. So uh, here we get um, WTI. So actually WTI is, is down 5% uh, today. Uh, if uh, for those of you, you are, who have been on the, uh, on the community chat, um, I mentioned when it was trading around the, the 66 that um, it looked like a, a potential uh, top, though then it went another 2% up, but since then it, it has been coming down. Today there was an interesting uh, IEA report um, about, you know, oil market for the next five years until 2026, so I, I strongly advise you to have a look at it. You don't need to read all of it, but, um, and the, uh, the, the conclusion is the same as what I've been saying for years is, um, for years, for months, sorry, is um, oil is there not because of high demand, is there because uh, the supply has been massively cut by, um, by the OPEC. Uh, if you look at the underlying with, uh, with oil, the demand is not expected to recover from these 2019 levels until 2023. So um, that is, uh, you can argue that it was the same when oil was at 50, uh, but now uh, it looks like uh, uh, th this report, uh, there is uh, soon as well the, the role of the contract. And uh, they are scared that um, inflation if there is too much inflation, that could be an issue for, for, for commodities, the strong dollar, and as well, um, big part of Europe uh, that will be closing again. So Europe uh, with, uh, I think, uh, uh, part of France will be closing today. Uh, Germany is not going to reopen today. Uh, so it, it is, it, it implies that um, um, demand could, could, could come down again. Um, I would like to go into um, the VIX that I, that I mentioned before. So the VIX, 
Uh, so the VIX is, is around the 19%. Uh, so there is a bit of a spike now because there is a bit of um, a might sell off in the market. Um, but we are at an important level. Um, don't get me wrong, we don't do technical analysis on the VIX. It's just to understand uh, what is the market perception towards uh, risky assets. Um, and um, here, uh, when, uh, if you look at what happened, so let's do, let's look at weekly and let's look at here. So if you look at what happened long time ago in 2009, 2010, it took a long time for the VIX to stay way below this 19%. Why? Because as I said, when market participants um, uh, are facing a big shock like they had in 2008, 2009, or when the same that we had in, in 2020, 2021, it takes time and, and market participants tend to um, over hedge themselves for longer than usual because they are a bit like shocked by what happened. So the VIX is, is coming down. Um, so that is that is that tells you that uh, um, uh, the, the risk on is, is, is quite strong. Um, if we look at now at the, the S&P um, through, uh, through the futures, so let me go and do a daily now. So what is the chart telling us? Uh, it's a bit messy, there are many, many lines, but the trend is still your friend. So um, I think uh, there is a good chance, um, maybe tomorrow actually. Uh, and again, <laughs> this is not investment advice, so don't put a position. Uh, because I'm saying saying that, but there is a lot of open interest on the S&P around 4,000. So normally when you go into the expiry, um, a market, a market makers, the gamma is always got a tendency to go into the uh, 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 big open interest. And the open interest, if you check is at 4,000 on the S&P and that would be uh, for the SPX on the open tomorrow for the spy that will be on the close. So, but there is a good chance that we might be uh, going into the 4,000. Then I think technically you will be looking at this trend if you want to go short. Let's say if, if some people want to go short, I think this is this is the, the target, uh, the trend that, that you should be uh, targeting. Um, as there has been rotation, this is the NASDAQ. So the NASDAQ is, is only a thousand point from, from the all time high. So uh, literally six, 7%. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were uh, literally in the sell off of the S&P and uh, of the S&P and the NASDAQ. And I had many questions of people asking me, Greg, when it's gonna stop. And as I said, you know, I don't know when it's gonna stop, but uh, the conclusion is, you know, uh, we are still on the S&P at all time high, on the, uh, the NASDAQ close to the all time high, on the Russell on the all time high. So um, the bulls are in charge and, and, and the trend is still very much on the way up. So um, if you, if in your, in your portfolio, you cannot um, uh, uh, swallow some, some down move, that means probably your positioning is, is, um, is a bit wrong. So um, trend is still up. Um, let's look at the Russell. Can I put the Russell on my nose? Yeah, so that's the Russell. So the Russell, as I said, is making almost new highs, very, very strong. Uh, the big picture is since we had uh, uh, the breaking, the breakout, sorry, it's even better in English, uh, in, at the start of November, um, this index has been really, really strong. So we have a really strong rotation in, in the market. Um, but the most important thing that we are all looking at these days is the US 10 years. So US 10 years, let me try to give you the big picture on the weekly chart. Boom. Okay, so that's, that's your weekly chart. So uh, if you look at the big picture, uh, we are still at very low level, okay. Um, what the market uh, doesn't want to have is big moves on the US 10 years too quickly. So as long as we go slowly from 170 to 2%, two, two market is perfectly fine. What the market doesn't want to have is if we are scared about too much inflation and we go very quickly to 2%. If you think about it, um, that is 
uh, at 170. Uh, and um, so if you think about what Powell was saying yesterday, and actually it look, he looked very much like an happy man. Um, US 10 years is at 175. People are saying, you know, and, and when I say people, you know, I'm looking at the volatility. So I'm not pretending to be uh, better than anyone here. I'm just saying that if we are at all time high on the S&P, every asset classes, or most asset classes, uh, risky asset classes are all time high. I think the Fed is, is pretty much happy. Having said that, they are clearly noticing that uh, some assets are uh, start to be overstretched. Um, Hello, you don't think the overall market is too early? If you pull a linear regression since 19, it happened in you. Uh, what is the fall, Ricard, that you'll be looking at? And um, because you're mentioning the fall. So I think the, the Fed um, so far is very happy about what is happening. Um, what was interesting from, 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 from the, the, the call yesterday or, or the meeting from Powell yesterday is on one hand, he's saying, oh, we are, uh, we are just looking at the numbers right now and we will be changing policy if the number change in the future. Then two minutes later, he was saying, we know that the numbers are gonna be very strong very soon and we'll have to change and we probably have to do something. So what does it tell you? It tells you that fiscal stimulus, so this is a, a, a political will and a, a, a monetary stimulus, which is coming from, from the Fed are extremely strong. So we are running this, um, this potato very hot, as I said, a couple of weeks ago. At the moment, there is no reason to change uh, that story. If you think as well that with the fiscal stimulus, there is a possibility that, and, and clear as, as what happened last year, that some Americans will put uh, some money at work out of their checks. Uh, that is, um, there is a lot of things for the market to go high on, and, and this is what is happening. Again, what we don't want to see for the US 10 years is the US 10 years to go very quickly to 2%. So there were some talks and, and some papers today that, um, or this week, that 2% is the, uh, the, the bad magical threshold where we're going to be, where we will be sell, seeing a sell off. If you look at this chart, we are just back to the level that we had in, in, in uh, 29, end of 2019, start of 2020. Really the question is more if the inflation that we start, uh, we might see, start to see in, in three to four months um, is gonna be, is gonna go uh, uh, much higher than the 2% target. So the market at the moment is, is pricing 220 to 30%, meaning that if inflation is at 2.2%, 2 2.3%, and you're holding a 1.7, 1.75 uh, bond, you get negative uh, real uh, uh, rate. So that means based on that investors, if inflation stay at 2.2, 2.5%, investors across the world will ask more for the US 10 years. On top of that, based on the fiscal stimulus, on the monetary stimulus, what you have is the treasury needs to print many, many bonds. So there is a lot of bond supply coming now in the next 18 months to the market. And the Fed is not big enough, or, uh, is, is big enough, but the Fed um, uh, cannot buying everything. So there is supply coming. When there is supply coming, like anything that you'll be buying, if there is a lot of supply, prices have to come down. And this is the same here. So you'll be asking for more. Um, and, and this is what we see in the US 10 years and the, U, and, and, and the bond market. If you look at the 10 versus the two, so the yield curve, uh, again, there has been, uh, so the chart is a bit rubbish here on, on that platform, but you can see that there's a, a strong steepening of the yield curve. Why? Because the, the two years is still in under control from the central bank. So the Fed is still in charge and in control of, of the short part of the, of the yield curve, but not of the long part of, of the yield curve. So uh, that, that's when you get steepening, when you get the GDP 
doing fine. Guess what you have in the meantime, you get the banks that are just doing incredibly well. So today KBE, KRE, so um, are on fire, JP Morgan and all of them are making all time high. So <laughs> what you can say here is, is the banker is always winning. Banker is always winning. And that really, uh, that tells you GDP um, is we're gonna have a massive GDP uh, print in in um, from 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 the first quarter, which I think is gonna come around mid-April, um, and then we're gonna have some inflation. So going into the next meeting, uh, the Fed will probably have to adjust uh, what they are doing. So this is something that we're gonna be ch checking later. Again, I'm, I'm checking the S and P. I think the S and P going into the expiry, there's a good chance that it's gonna grind higher. Um, and this grind IR goes to into 3980, 4000, um, because generally this is what we have. So in terms of, of, of how to put the risk, my philosophy is, is always the same. This week, which is the week of the expiry, the market is, you, you can tell that the underlying is not moving much, then it is moving, but literally it is, it is 95% of the time it will be uh, go, going higher. And if you think that the market is mispricing th something for the repricing or for the new risk to happen, I think you have to wait for the expiry, which is tomorrow. Why, if you think about options, is when you buy an option, there is a market maker. Okay, so the market maker is always hedging himself, gamma, delta, whatever. Okay, so when it is expiring, is we starting with a new book. So there is new position and that's the same with you. There is new position. So if you're running a long short and you're having many position, some of your position will be expiring tomorrow based on your, on your contract, which is the, the, the quarterly contract. So that means from Monday onwards, you'll be uh, uh, starting new, you might be starting new position. And this is the time where actually, if you look at what happened very often, this is the time when the market uh, uh, is experiencing a bit more volatility and it is experiencing a bit of change, um, might be for a couple of days, might be for a couple of weeks, can be for longer. If we look at last year, actually the, the, the market uh, started to move. So we had the sell off and the market started to reverse after the expiry. So expiry are, are very often a good time for uh, 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 potential reversion time. Having said that, I think the market is still very hot and there is, a, there is and when I say very hot, is, is there is a lot of liquidity in the system and, and, and it's gonna be hard for the market to completely collapse based on, on what we have. Economy is gonna be printing uh, very good GDP. You're gonna, again, you get the monetary stimulus, the fiscal stimulus. So this is a lot of things. Um, uh, that that are pushing uh, the the market higher. Um, I think this is this is it. Um, let's move back to the um, to this um, the Fed. So this is exactly the same uh, uh, presentation that I did a couple of weeks ago, but but I just changed changed the numbers. Um, but I should have changed the data as well. So uh, at the at, at the bot at the top, sorry, is the third of March. At the bottom, it was as of yesterday, and that's the euro dollar curve. So if you look at the euro dollar uh, curve, what you can see is actually from from June 2023, this one has been moving uh, down almost 10 bips. So more and more. The market is now, market participants are pricing the Fed to high rates in uh, 2023. So actually, if you look at 2022, which is this one. So if you do 2022 versus today, you, so, sorry, I'm a bit, uh, I, I do a bit like a, like a kid, a five years old kid doing some, some drawings. But if you look at the differential between 1999.82 minus 99.57, you get a 25, 25 bips differential. And that tells you now that there is roughly 90 to 100% pricing by the market that the Fed will rate hike by 25 bips in December, 2022. So if you remember correctly, before we were not saying anything before 2024. 
Uh, so that was a couple of months ago. Uh, yesterday, the Fed said, or Powell said, you know, we're not going to do much until we need to, and, uh, um, and probably it's going to be in 2024. So here there is, I think in, in English, you say there is a game of chicken. Uh, so someone is lying. Uh, very often what happens is, is the, uh, uh, the Fed at one stage has to follow the market and has to adjust. That was the case on the way down, on the way up, so in 2018, at the end of 2018, start of 2019. Um, just the Fed, to me, and not only to me, is, is very happy to run this potato very hot. Um, and that means uh, 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 by saying we are just taking the numbers right now, but we will adjust when we get a confirmation of the numbers. I mean, that is not necessarily what you should happen from, from central banks, but um, um, I, I don't want to, to go into the camp of, of criticism. I think they've done a good job, a very hard job to do. Uh, it's just that if there is inflation, for sure, uh, they can't wait uh, two, uh, two years, two or three years to do something. So they will have to do uh, something sooner than, than what they are pretending that they might do. Um, they are very, uh, pragmatic in that sense, so um, well done to them. Um, and and but for us as as investors, this is what what is priced by the market at the moment. Um, let's do a bit of of, of macro um, just to understand where we are uh, in terms of of leading indicators. So the housing market has been hot, hot, hot for the last twelve months. Uh, the new permits yesterday uh, were pretty bad versus the expectation that needs to be put in the context of, um, of the uh, 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 miserable uh, February in terms of weather in the US. Um, so very often you have a seasonality based on, on the weather in the US. Having said that, uh, there are some components of the housing market where we should start to be looking at, uh, uh, which are uh, um, if we look at what uh, we discussed just before, the U.S. 10 years and the U.S. 30 years mortgage in the U.S., which is, I think it's at 2.5%, it's up 60 bips in two months. So there are less favorable conditions now based on financing uh, 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 for uh, the housing market. So that is really something to... Um, to check um, and to follow here, this, this is the correlation between the, the building permits and the ITB. Uh, ITB, which stands for uh, the ETF for the home builders. There is a very strong correlation. So if and if uh, uh, we have uh, a slowdown in the building permits, as you can see, that are very high level from, from uh, what they were a couple of years ago. But actually, if you, if you go back to the chart and you put a chart of building permits before crisis, we used to have building permits around this level. So uh, still, this sector has been very helpful for the US economy uh, and the, uh, uh, the ITV overall has been doing very well. Another part of, of, of the data that we had uh, this week is, is the retail sales. So months on months, uh, February, was a bit of a, of a bad month um, across, um, across the retail sales. Uh, but you need to take into account each, each time that you look at retail sales to be looking at what happened before. So you need to look at the revised numbers. And the revised number were more or less uh, uh, the, uh, the mirror of, of, of the miss that we, have, uh, that we had in, in, in February. But what, um, looking forward, what we should have is good months of March and February based on the fiscal, uh, sorry, on, yes, on the stimulus package that is coming. So a, a, every American, uh, lucky them, they are getting a check these days, this month and next month. So that's going to boost um, the, uh, uh, the US consumption. And as well, uh, the weather is obviously much better than it was a month ago with the, uh, the Texas um, uh, weather, uh, for instance. Um, something that I want to carry on discussing, uh, and we have been looking at it actually since September. Since September 2020, we have been looking at rotation when the FANG stocks started to underperform uh, the S&P. So those rotation in the market um, have 
uh, have been around for the last six months. Uh, an interesting rotation is obviously the large cap versus the small cap. So here we get the SPY, which stands for the S&P 500 versus the small cap with the SLY. And as you can see, the trend has been very strong since the election, which came more or less hand in hand with uh, uh, the vaccine news. Uh, so uh, uh, small caps have been outperforming massively large caps since then, uh, 30, 20 to 30 percent. Uh, this is why you got the Russell that is making new uh, new time uh, as we discussed. Uh, so this rotation has been very strong. And actually what you can see as well, it's not only that uh, we've, we reversed what happened during 2020 uh, COVID, but we came much lower than this. So if, if I look at the star, you know, if you, that is the level when we started the COVID, but we had another uh, a move down in the uh, uh, in that ratio, uh, so there has been a strong appetite for uh, a small cap versus large cap. This is rotation num number one. Rotation number two, and there are many of those, um, is is growth versus value. So actually, if you look at growth versus value, the uh, uh, and and you think that we should be uh, there should be a reversion to the mean. This reversion to the mean should come to this level. There is still a long way to go, meaning that uh, um, don't get uh, fooled by the headlines. Growth is not dead. Okay, growth is not dead. It's just that growth um, overall as a sector, as a sector, uh, 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 sorry, uh, as a factor investment uh, has been struggling over the last couple of months. Why? Because it was really, really hot. Okay, so when something is really hot, there is always a reversion to the mean. It's, it's hard to time those things, but it's going to happen. Um, what happened in, in, in 2020, everyone was chasing those names, the growth names, because we were all thinking the, the end of the world is coming. What is making any, any, any growth in this world? There is the case, obviously, when yields are going up, that uh, um, it's detrimental to growth. Having said that, if you have a company that is growing 20, 30, 40%, does it really matter that your discount cash flow is at 1%, 1.5 or 2%? What really matter is, is the level of growth. To me is when we do the, uh, 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 the mentoring is each time I look at a stock, people come and say, oh, I had done this education and this education is telling me I need to buy something at 50p and above and selling something with 10p and below. And I have to explain to people that when you're buying stocks on high P, by definition, you're asking for very high, high growth, compounding growth. But if you buy something on 80 times earnings and it goes to 60 times earnings, that means the stock in between is down 25%, okay, if we take the same growth. And still at 60 times earnings, it can be pretty high or seen as pretty high. So that means when there is a risk off, there is just a change. There might be no real change on the growth expectation, but instead of paying 80, 90, 100 times, you pay 60, 70, 80 times. And that changes everything. So I don't think this is a story of, you know, growth is dead and, and it's just that all those stocks we were, I mean, we were, many market participants were paying very high, uh, 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 um, let's say, uh, metrics, multiples, uh, and now it, it is coming down. Having said that, if you look at where the NASDAQ is, the NASDAQ composite is at 5% from the all time high. So please don't give me the, uh, there is a, a, the end of the world of growth, or, you know, we are back to level that we had uh, two or three years ago. Look at this chart. This chart is telling you that we are uh, still uh, something like 20% to 25% above the level that we had at the start of 2020. So there is rotation, but it's not to the extent that what people have been saying. It's just that when you buy something, when you long stocks that have been moving 100, 200% 
in six months, don't get surprised that those stocks can go down by 20% because based on the beta, there is a good chance that when there is a hiccup of five, 10%, they're gonna be moving 20 to 30%. So next one on the rotation, uh, this is a chart that I really, <laughs> I really like, which is the XLE versus the XLK, which tells you a lot about what has been happening since, since, since February. So for, since, since the start of February, uh, there has been uh, actually strong rotation uh, um, across uh, the, the sector. So if we take the 11 sectors of the S&P, some time ago, the market passive investment, everything was going up and XLK was just outperforming. So you had a, a chart where everything was going nicely up uh, with a bit of, let's say, 20% more or 30% more for the XLK. But over the last six weeks, eight weeks, there has been massive dispersion. And it's not only the XLE versus the XLK, but you can say the same with the XLF, you can say the same with uh, XLU. Really, uh, it was a time to generate alpha, uh, much uh, easier to say and harder to do, because as an investor, you are playing with the odds. Okay, so you're playing in the odds and when there is absolute uh, dispersion like the way there is, it is hard not to play against the odds that are way uh, uh, extended. But this chart is very interesting because you can see that XLK, which are for the, uh, um, the techno stocks are, are roughly flattish on the year, whereas the XLE is up 30%. So that's that leads you into another chart that I put on the, um, on the community, which is, um, 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 sorry, uh, some versus Apple. So um, looking at, at the spread between oil major and Apple. And as you can see, um, it, you can see this, this, this massive dispersion. So here there has been rotation um, and, and normally based on passive investment, this is not something that you, that you will see that often. So over the last six weeks, there has been massive dispersion. Um, and that leads into, into something that is important for tomorrow is um, if you think from market goes from one cycle to another. And one of the cycles that we are using, that we are using is every quarter we get the option expiry. Okay, so on the third Friday of March, June, September, December, we get the quadruple reaching. So which are the stock index futures, the stock index options, the stocks options, and the single stock futures. So single stock futures, not really. So let's say it's, it's, it's th a, a triple reaching day. Um, and on that day, which is tomorrow, what we see, we're gonna have big volume, okay? Because as I said, many contracts are expiring tomorrow. There is a large open interest large open interest for the single names and for the S&P, SPX and SPY. So again, if you look at the S&P and if you go on the CBOE.com, you look at the option chain, you look at tomorrow what is the biggest open interest on the, uh, um, on the option chain, it's around 4,000. It's not around, it's 4,000. So there is a lot of open interest, which normally, as I said, historically you go into that, that direction. Um, but that means as well that if we look at the dispersion that we had recently, it's uh, uh, the winners are keep on winning and the losers keep on losing. So that means the dispersion is getting bigger and bigger. And if there is a chance that it might stop to disperse the way it has been, will be, uh, let's say from tomorrow after the close. Okay, so quadruple reaching day, we know that the market is more and more looking into options, that market is more and more driven by options. Uh, and I'm not saying that you, um, uh, with options that you should be making 500% plus as a return and that you should be following my education. I'm just doing that for months and for years that the market is more and more looking at these options. If we don't understand how these options are driving the market, what are the important level on the S&P on the stock, it, it makes our investment very hard. So tomorrow we're gonna have some expiry. 
So for the S&P, as I said, it's uh, on the open for the S&P, uh, on the close for the SPY. That's the same for the European markets. Uh, so this is a slide that I used every three months uh, to give you a bit of when are the, the different uh, markets expiring uh, on their own time. So for the UK, this is uh, uh, on the uh, auction from 10, 10, not the auction, but from 10, 10 to 10, 15. On the Swiss market, this is on the open. For the Euro stocks, uh, look at between 10.50 and 11 a.m. UK time, as very often the market is moving 50, 1%, 2% during those 10 minutes. In Germany, there's going to be a very important auction at 12 p.m., especially why? Because many German stocks have been moving like crazy. So a um, couple of weeks ago, I mentioned Volkswagen. So Volkswagen. If you've been on the chat, that is something that we've been discussing. There has been this short squeeze. There is a lot of, of, of open position. So uh, Volkswagen, Daimler, BMW, you can make sure that tomorrow at the print, there, there might be some, some big volume and post potentially some uh, good uh, uh, um, uh, mispricing. So always a good way uh, to, uh, uh, to make potentially uh, money on, on the day. Similar to uh, that, what we have on that day, it's not only the expiry, but there is a lot of index rebalancing. So here I took the example of the stock 600, which is for Europe, but you can do the same with the S&P where you get new name, new names coming. And so you get some deletions and some inclusion into those, uh, those indexes. Uh, you remember, three months ago that during, uh, in December, the index rebalancing was for Tesla that was included in the S&P. So between the time of the announcement in November and the time it was uh, uh, included in the S&P, it went for 420 to I think 695. Um, and, and, and what, what is the importance of, of rebalancing is you have natural flows going in or going out. So if you are an index fund, you need to own those names. Tomorrow, you, if you are replicating the stock 600, you will have from tomorrow at the close to own Virgin Money UK as a loan. So that means you are a forced buyer of those stocks. On the other hand, if you've been, if you were own, uh, owning Telefonica Deutschland, uh, you need to sell them on the close because it's not part of your uh, universe anymore. So that is important because, I mean, that can be seen as more as a trading uh, pattern, but that is important because those are the flows. Uh, so you can be playing them before the announcement, on between the time of the announcement and the time it's going to be effective. And obviously on the auction, which is going to happen tomorrow, um, in, in the, there is an interesting one as well tomorrow, which is going to be uh, Baba, uh, so Alibaba between the US line and the Hong Kong line. Uh, so selling the US line and buying the Hong Kong line. So those are the things more for, for, for trader, for trading, but um, always important to understand the flow. To come back on the S&P and, and what is the flow, uh, there is always something that is uh, interesting and um, which is the, the end of the month, end of the quarter flows. So, and here we are talking about the 60, 40% mutual fund um, um, positioning. So that's something that I've been talking quite a lot, which is the rebalancing of the end of the month or the end of the quarter or the end of the year. So if you are a mutual fund, you own 60% bonds and 40% equities, let's say. So if we look at the months, if you look at these quarters, quarter bonds have been done massively. So your 60% of bonds suddenly is much smaller because your bonds are down 10, 20%. So instead of having 60%, you get 50%. And your stocks with the S&P, for instance, are up five to 10%. So based on your mandate, what you need to do is before the end of the quarter, you need to rebalance your portfolio, meaning that you need to be buying bonds and you need to be selling some stock. So you have, after this expiry, uh, looking at the S&P, 
after this expiry, you do have both positive action with fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, but in terms of uh, price, uh, in terms of uh, uh, flows and positioning, there are some potentially negative uh, uh, short-term uh, selling pressure. Okay, so don't be surprised if starting next week, um, and I can see uh, on, on my tweet feed that there are many traders that uh, stand ready <laughs> for the potential a spike in, in, in the volatility and the potential uh, sell-off in, in equity. Um, quickly, uh, I'm not gonna bore you too much uh, about my education. So uh, I started, I think it's three weeks ago, four weeks ago, um, a community on the website. Uh, so here you get an example. Um, we now have uh, 60 people, which is not bad, 60 people uh, split between the four by four a platform and a mentoring platform. Um, I know it's it's getting some traction. People are getting put in and getting some ideas. Um, uh, the good thing is even during the weekend, I had a very nice email from one of my competitor uh, who is always hiding between a fake account and with memes. So another booting. Uh, uh, email on the trading community, but that tells me that actually this is a good thing that we are doing this trading community together. Uh, even if it's only 60 people for the time being, uh, it's going to get better, it's going to grow. So uh, that is the whole idea uh, with my education. I try to help you as much as possible and being part of the community where we can be sharing ideas. So on top of this community, there is the 4 by 4 video series, which is a comprehensive online video course uh, where you're going to get a professional investment process. Uh, I launched this product um, in October 2019, so quite recent, uh, where we're going to have and you're going to have macro analysis and building your infrastructure uh, to, uh, to generate trades across asset classes with a focus on stocks. Um, and my ID generation is very similar to what I try to explain during those, those webinars, those presentations, top-down, bottom-up, special situation in active trading. Um, I give you many Excel spreadsheets with all the resources and all the, the data and, and uh, uh, the sources of those documents. So I'm not going to be asking you for more. It's just that for you to help you building your infrastructure. After the 4 by 4 and if you are a more advanced trader, uh, you can do the mentoring. So this is one-on-one -on -one session on Skype. Um, it's 12 sessions over three to five months. Um, this is implementation. This is about building your, your track record. If you want to have access to the, uh, to, to the industry, it is about, you know, managing your own portfolio. Um, that works very well. Uh, uh, very well in the sense that I'm very lucky. I have very high quality mentees uh, since I left this previous company. So I'm very, very lucky. I hope that all the mentees and the four by four subscribers can see during, on the community that this is higher quality than what they had in the past. So this is, uh, I, I enjoy doing the mentoring again. This is why as well, I wanted to build this community because I'm getting a lot of, of good things. Um, and and uh, when I say good things, it, it's, I think it's important when you are a trader to share ideas. So let's carry on with it. Um, should we do some questions or maybe you don't have any questions? And um, you get any questions or should we go with all of us? Okay, uh, Rika, given the current market conditions and the low VIX then, uh, interest sector based on ISM long short. Yeah, I think, um, so the, the question is about how, how to do your risk management and how to, uh, to construct your ideas. Uh, intra sector is always uh, um, good to have some intra sector in your portfolio, uh, 40, 60%, it, it depends on, on, on where is the market. Why? Because by doing intra sector, normally you should be killing the market risk, you should be killing the sector risk. So it's pure alpha generation. But we know as well that it's sometimes hard to find good match uh, on an industry level. So um, if you find those good ideas, let's go for it. I think we are in a time that 
you, as always, and this is what I advocate to in the four by in the four by four, is you should limit your net exposure to uh, long or short to thirty percent. Um, if you can start with it, I think you, you'll be fine. Um, what is the Dix Gix? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure which one that is. Uh, but check. Um, maybe send me an email, and and I'll come back to you. Um, can you pair this based on EPSP comparison in intrasector, given that they are? Uh, so when we do the mentoring, um, there is there is a part of the mentoring and any investment where you look at your sector and you look at your industry and you look at how much you'll be paying. So you'll be looking at the multiples. Okay, so. Let's say you look at the banks. If you look at the banks, you look at uh, uh, which are on fire today. You'll be looking at return on equity. You'll be looking at price to book. You'll be looking at book value. You'll be looking at earnings rolls. And you, the first uh, easy way to do your screening is on the quantitative. Okay, so you look at the numbers and say, if I pay X for let's say Walmart, how much am I paying for Kroger? And that means you'll have to compare the top line, the bottom line, the quality of the balance sheet, how they are financing, how they are growing. So those are the things that um, we do at every single session when we do the mentoring. Um, question from Mohamed, uh, how can I find the data about sectors in the ISM manufacturing reports? Is it free? Because I could not find it. When you mean the data about the sectors, um, so just to give you a bit of, of understanding, the, the ISM is based on the NAICS nomenclature. So each single company in the US has an NAICS number. So if you look and take the 18 sectors of the ISM, that will translate into some NAICS num numbers that are on one company. So if the, NA, the ISM is saying, let's say utilities are doing fine, by definition, you'll be picking on all the NAICS utilities companies. Um, uh, so that's a country member, which number that is. And you start doing the, the filtering this way. Uh, so that is something that uh, I do to the four by four. I think it's video 19, 20, 21, and, and, and you will get a different spreadsheet to do it. Okay, anything else? Um, okay, I think this is it for today. So again, expiry tomorrow, uh, we might reset, um, reset when I say reset is, is um, uh, there is the expiry tomorrow, as there is the expiry, there is potentially a reset from, 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 the, from the close uh, uh, of yesterday. I hope it was helpful. Uh, if you get questions, send me an email. Uh, questions on everything, question on the mentoring, question on the four by four. Uh, very happy um, to, to, uh, to answer you. If you want one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, or Skype, uh, I do as well if you get more questions. So thank you very much. I'll try to do another webinar in two weeks. Otherwise, if you want to have a more specific uh, webinar, um, uh, just let me know. Thank you very much. Talk to you in two weeks. Bye-bye.